right, everyone, I think we'll get started. My name is Dean Heiss. I'm Student Services Supervisor here in Wauwatosa School District. My director, Therese Kwiatkowski, can't be here tonight. We are pushing forward, the theme being um, recreation and summer options. And I know for some of us who were here earlier in the school year, um, don't know if it was an agenda item or not, but I think we had some of the most robust discussion ever at these meetings around summer school. And I think things were building as people were talking about things you know, their experiences, experiences for their, for their children. And um, we know that we can talk a little bit, uh, we have some people from both within the district and, without, and outside the district. Um, I thank everyone for coming to, to help us out and kind of round out and give um, beyond just the district uh, options that are out there um, for students. So we have Mike Wick from the Wauwatosa Recreation Department, Recreation Department. Dan Kiesner and Mary Ellen, and Mary Ellen Kiesner from Special <laughs> Olympics are here as well. And James Lundstrom from the YMCA. Um, later on, I guess we'll have a little more discussion. Linda Dussel, one of our special education teachers, is here. Just talk a little bit about special education procedures and, and maybe if we want to continue some of the, uh, the conversation we had earlier in the year about just um, answering some questions, the who's, what's, why's, and how's regarding uh, summer school programming for students with um, and I guess I, I do want to give a thank you for the parents who have come out. I know that nights are busy, family lives are busy, and just um, thank you for coming out and being part of this because parents are what make it and what um, help us get our programs better. Um, I guess I want to start off with um, Mike Wick from the Recreation Department. And for those who are presenting from outside the district, um, if you can try to maybe present from here. Uh, I'm trying to get a little more savvy with some of our parents who wanted to be here tonight but couldn't and said, okay, for the people who are presenting, you know, maybe we can tape that and get it to you uh, via DVD or something like that. Um, like I said before, <laughs> maybe it can get us a little more into the 21st century. So uh, without further ado, my quick. Do you want me to stand up there again or am I good? Give me a camera out. range. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, okay. He's going to put it up on YouTube later. <laughs> <laughs> a, a cautionary tale about what not to say. <laughs> or what, whatever, you know. <laughs> How many hits do you want? Yeah. Um, so I guess my role here tonight is more of a, in a question and answer setting. Um, I'm new to the rec department. Uh, July 1st was my start date. Um, I really want to hear the feedback from the parents that participate in our programs. Um, do we meet the needs of your children? Uh, are we falling short in some areas? Do we excel in some areas? What can we do to better serve this population? Um, it really, our, our goal as a rec department is to provide the best recreational outlets for the community. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job of that currently, but that's what I don't really know uh, from your perspective how you view that. So I guess if you could help me out with that, you know, just open the floor up to comments at this point. I, I can start if that's okay. Um, our son Will is four. We've been doing swim lessons mm -hmm. through the Chester Rec Department. Um, was largely very disappointed in the group sessions. Um, uh, Will has Down syndrome. Probably some sensory issues going on there too with the, the loud noise and the water and all of that stuff in swim lessons. Um, Oftentimes in the little kids' sessions, you have four teenagers standing together in a huddle. You can't hear what they're asking you to do, and the parents that need help don't get help. The parents whose kids are doing fine are the ones that they go visit and chit-chat with. But for the most part, they're teenagers standing together in a huddle, not, mm -hmm. not working with the, the kids in the class. So pretty disappointed until one time one of, the, one, of the, um, one of the girls came over and said, you know what, I think you could benefit from one-on-one -on -one swim lessons. And I'm like, that's great. But the brochure said you had to be eight. Well, I think we could make an exception. So a couple of emails later, poof, Will's in adaptive swim lessons. And it's great. And I can't say enough great things about it, but it was just a random sure. conversation that I, I didn't know how to do. Yeah, I, I don't know how to do that. And then he got through the first five-week session, and then... What do I do then? Oh, I have to ask. 
to get put into the next five week sure, session. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask to get put in the next five week session. But for him, the consistency and the repetitiveness is what he needs to, to make improvements. And it's been good, but the little things like that, to, to know that you can make exceptions, that you don't have to be eight, you could be four. I mean, and I know that's probably not true across the board, mm -hmm. but that, I mean, I had to email for them to open it up, so then I had to go register online, but they had to re open it up for me so that I could go register. You're familiar with that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I, to I totally agree with you. Like, I knew my daughter, and I didn't even try for the group swim mm -hmm. lessons. She's, you know, she, she's got all her other disabilities, but then she's hearing impaired. So mm -hmm. you take her hearing aids away, it's, there's, there's no way. Mm -hmm. And so I called and talked to Kristen, I yeah. think. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. She, she bonded with my daughter over being hearing impaired. I guess she is as well. But she walked me through it and said, okay, here's what's going to do. You call at, you know, at the beginning of everything. We give you the special code. And it's like the best kept secret of, well, yeah. tell us a wrap. Is these magical <laughs> <sp -less laughs> You know, They're every wonderful. time you They're get, wonderful. they pair them with, and they are the, I guess, the teenage lifeguards or whatever. And I've always kind of walked in and I'm like, oh, okay, teenager, you know, you, you don't know my kid. Like, and they have blown me out of the water every time of just really coming to her level and just doing an amazing job. And so I got to give you guys kudos for that. And I mean, maybe you don't want to spread the word because then it'll be harder for our kids. <laughs> but it's. We get first dibs, though, it's, right? <laughs> it's like one of those things that, you know, I mean, a lot of doors are shut when your kids have these disabilities, and it's one thing that you can kind of regain. And I've always told the, the like, teenagers who are trying to teach her how to swim, I don't care how she swims. You know, I don't care if it's a doggy paddle or something. I'm just looking for her to survive, survive long <laughs> enough for me to reach her. Yeah. And, you know, once you kind of break away from the proper stroke model and stuff, mm -hmm. then... It seems to relax, and it's just been so wonderful. Yeah. And we've had Love Dave it. as an instructor for Will, and he's been okay. really patient with him. I know there's another girl, she must be about 10, and I think her parents have, have experienced a little frustration because they have a different instructor every time. Mm -hmm. And they feel like a, the same instructor for their child every time would be much better. Sure. And for a, a lot of our kiddos, the consistency is everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I really like Dave, so it's so Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so probably just some different language in the rec guide about, I think those classes are called by myself or something like they that. Are. There's two different codes. Yeah, and it's two so different ones. It is confusing, so maybe changing that. And, I, and we've done it, although I think the rec department has maybe asked us not to. I mean, my daughter, they're just trying to get her to even sit on the pool deck. Oh. You know, put her foot in the water sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that there have been other parents abusing it um, because it's a kind of this private lesson, mm. and... Oh, and it is know, fairly <laughs> inexpensive for being one-on-one, yes. and, on one. and so I can see where there's that tendency. Maybe, I mean, you can, uh, I don't know, what's what's the term we're all, like, sensitive to is, like, special needs or something like that? IEP? Could it be yeah. <laughs> but it's also, it's also oh, built as something for kids who are afraid of the water, so there are kids that aren't yeah, with disabilities that are terrified of the water. You know, I just have a kid who's both. Um, and so I think maybe a little different language around that. And I agree with what you said about the eight-year-old. And I think just changing it, you know, students or people with disabilities, call us if you want to, because mm -hmm. the, the rec department is excellent. I've always signed up for mm -hmm. things a grade level below. If it's baseball and we weren't ready to hit without a tee, They've been great about letting you sign up for the next lower level, just asking. But maybe parents don't know that you can do that. Well, I, I think the rewording of, of a description certainly would, mm -hmm. would go a long way. Um, and certainly our goal is to make the experience as best as it can be. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, th these are the things I want to hear. I'm glad to hear we are having some success stories. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, mm -hmm. we, we want to continue that, mm -hmm. and rewording, that seems like an easy enough thing to do. We, we do try to accommodate. Um, the problem that you run into in trying to accommodate is if you try to accommodate everybody, you end up accommodating no one. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. while we certainly do strive to, to do that, just please keep that in mind. Mm -hmm.
I think one thing that I saw um, a few years back, I, I believe it was the West Dallas, what, West Milwaukee Rec Department, they had a program in the winter um, where there was an elementary school that once a week you could sign up and it was only for kids with special needs and their parents could go too. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to get the kids just active, doing something. So it might be we might have basketballs out or we might have hula hoops out. And it allowed the parents too to network and, and talk with one another. Um, and sometimes it is hard for kids you know, to find those recreational outlets to get exercise. Sure and try to just maintain good health. I would love to see some kind, and it wouldn't be, it, it's something you pay for. So it's like any other rec department class, but possibly, you know, every Tuesday at Underwood, you know, from six to seven. It's sort of like, and it's run by, maybe community partners might be interested in helping or getting the therapeutic rec students at UWM involved mm -hmm. in it and have a way for kids to get more exercise. Do you, do you know, I, mean, I'll, I, I can certainly reach out to them and ask a little more about that program, but is it a structured, or is it more of an open play social environment? You know, I don't know, but I, I, we didn't sign up for that, but I saw that, and I'm wondering if other people, you know, other rec department directors around the community, I, I saw that concept, and I thought, that's great. Just, to, it's, it's hard sometimes in the winter, and if your kid, doesn't have the coordination to be out there trying mm -hmm. skiing or what you know <laughs> or what have you that it, it just is a way to burn off energy rather inexpensively and getting kids interacting with other kids their own ages too and meeting new friends no uh, from, from that class <clears throat> um, you said it was offered six to seven. Um, is that a... Oh, I was just making that up. Oh, I don't okay. know why it was. <laughs> <laughs> so let's float it out there, though. Is, that, is, it, is it Saturday morning? Is that the time that we target? Is it during the week for an hour? Is it right, right after dinner? Week. Is it? I, I would think, you know, even to like 45 minutes, like, have it, I, I'm just kind of coming up with some kind of, and maybe, you know, people wouldn't be it. Maybe I'd be the one saying it. Um, but just having something where kids can go and run around, particularly in the winter time, to get some level of physical activity okay. and exercise. I like the idea of it being more structured. My son played um, with his brother, who's younger than him by two years, on the Upward basketball team. And he, he really enjoyed the structure of once a week, he would ask every day until Friday, practice today, practice today, and then finally Friday came and he was like the happiest kid and they started off dribbling back, dribbling mm -hmm. forward, passing, and it wasn't, um, now it's getting a little bit harder for him, but he just loved that he was going to do something every Friday with a group of kids. He didn't know if they were younger than him and he was involved. So if he's doing something like that, maybe a little more structure to it. And mm -hmm. parents, we sat there, mm -hmm. we watched, mm -hmm. and we did talk to each other. Um, <coughs> but you can make it to their level mm -hmm. with something simple, and introducing soccer. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody's going to hit in the goal, or try a dribble, or whatever. And not too big of a group either, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of our kids have sensory issues. So like this team was 10, 10 children. Obviously, they were all... Um, regular ed kids, but maybe 10 kids would be manageable, mm -hmm. not too loud with basketballs and soccer balls flying all over the place. But I yeah. think a little structure is a little better because then you can get a little, like, why am I coming here for an open play day? I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea that they might be learning something, learning how to play basketball, mm -hmm. learning how, what, introducing them to something they might not normally be able to join with the regular ed kids. So, uh, Teresa and I had spoken a little bit about this general idea uh, a few months back. So we, we put a little framework to a program similar to that. Um, it certainly isn't ready to bring and present, but um, I, I also think it's a good idea. Uh, from a structure standpoint, as a programmer, I think there needs to be some type of structure. Otherwise, you do run into that, why are we coming here? <laughs> and see, it's easier to, to skip. So um, that is something we are investigating at this time. 
You guys have that sports of all sorts program, I think, for <laughs> three to five year olds or something like that. <laughs> Even that concept, every right. week it's a different thing. Yep. Or it might be we bring out the parachute and one week it's parachute games or you know, or something like that. Yeah. I think there's a lot of options oh, yeah. as far as how, how we, we could structure it, but just so you know that, that we have been talking about that already and you know, it is in somewhat of a developmental phase at this point. So any other feedback um, for me, for the rec department, I can take back and talk with the staff about it. Yeah, I guess I'm j I've just been reluctant to sign up, Will, for some of the other um, programs that I have signed up my older son for just because I was unsure of mm -hmm. whether or not the, you know, the teenagers oftentimes that are there would be able to handle it. And um, I, I've always been pleasantly like you said, the, they were wonderful. I think that they are actually better than adults. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're good when they have the information. Right, and that's true. And and I've, learned, I've learned, learned that the hard way, is that the information that I think is conveyed behind the scenes is not. Right. And I so, walk in with the, the yes. behavioral plan, because mm -hmm. I don't think they get that, so I give it to them myself, and I give them a little lowdown. This is Evan. He loves to play. He's partially verbal. I just give them a little lowdown about him. And then I give him a behavioral plan of, if this happens, please do this, because he'll respond to it. Mm -hmm. And it's worked. He did camp well with JC for two years. He loved it. Okay. He really enjoyed it. But I also did ask for somebody that could, uh, I think he was with the college, I think it was a college student that was with him, was a special ed student. That's what she was studying. Mm -hmm. So I think that that helped, too, because she had a different understanding. Um, for playground, we had I we just really lucked out with the girl that really took him under her wing. Her sister has a disability and she just got him and I mean we continue to go even though he was older and the program was wonderful, they let him in there because he has a younger brother and we wanted to keep them together. Sure. Um so I think requesting that help. Mm -hmm. Um you guys have always given it to me whenever I've asked, Can I have Someone who has knowledge, someone who maybe education-wise helps. Yep. I think the, the communication there is the key. We, we want to provide the correct and right staffing mm -hmm. for, for for your kids. Um, so I, I all I could ask you uh, is maybe to never assume that we have it on file, uh, the behavioral plan, the, the extra <laughs> communication, anything you can do to help us. So that we, would we be confidential, really so that we wouldn't be yeah. allowed to just hand over somebody's you know, behavior plan. Yeah, but when we have an IEP to but post a rec, yeah. every, year we, every year we sign the forms for the IEP to go right. over to summer school right. so that the teachers know, and right. every year they've never seen it when I bring it in. And I, I'm just kind of tired of my daughter falling through the cracks. And I'm well, the rec department classes are the same as the summer school classes. Just so no, I'm, the rec department and summer school are different. But she's saying even with the summer school. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, so, I honestly, the only ones that we do take with my my special needs daughter are the swimming lessons. Okay. Because yeah, the swimming I, lessons would not, that those instructors right, would not have ideas. Right, and that's where I go in. But for summer school, I, I, I did. I don't anymore expect the teachers to understand that we're coming in with a different set of circumstances. And... Now I've just learned that I just take them the IEP myself and I have to go explain it. It's, it's just kind of frustrating that that happens when it's... I think when, when I talk about summer school, then maybe, I mean, I don't know your particular circumstance, mm -hmm. and I can maybe help with that, with answering <coughs> questions. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that that summer adventure club program in the afternoons, yes. in the summer, and then during the off weeks is very popular, mm -hmm. and the, the Student Services Department has been really great about providing extra assistance for those programs for special needs students. No question. Right. What's the Summer Adventure Club? That's, um, it's kind of, it piggybacks summer school. A lot of children go to summer school in the morning, because it's half day, and then they go to Summer Adventure Club, which is kind of the extended day. Oh. So it's like a, it's, it, they call it Adventure Camp, and uh, it's like a, afternoon rec program. It's a little more organized than a playground program. Yeah, that's, it, there's, it's, it's like a, it's, your, it's in the long, it's a longer summer camp day. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's 
planned activities, it's, it's trips, it's a variety of different things that you would get at summer camp. Any other questions or comments for I would. I just thought of something, and you know, the booklet, if there is any way to like say, you know, with an asterisk or something, say, you know, this is an experienced teacher or this is an all-inclusive kind of thing or something to indicate that it would be open to children of all of levels. You know, because sometimes you sign up for soccer and everybody can mm -hmm. play soccer and they're not willing to slow down for your kid. But sometimes, you know, you, you have a situation where it's very different and they can accommodate. And so if there's any way to indicate, you know, these are easily accommodated activities. Okay. That would be nice. Anybody else? Any, any other comments I could take back and discuss with our programmers? I appreciate the opportunity and, and thank you for coming in. So yeah, welcome. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Well, thank you. And, uh, you and know, come back and, you know, if you need parents to bounce things off of, yeah, you know, come yes. back there to the group and I think many of us want to be partners. And well, and that's what we're looking for as so. well. Especially in, in situations where we're not the expert, mm -hmm. you know, we we really lean to, to you parents as helping guide us. We can put the, the programs and the structure together, but as far as what those are included, mm -hmm. these are really our experts there. So uh, I will most likely take you up on. It. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Mary Ellen Dan. Mary Ellen and Dan. Mary Ellen and Dan. Well, She's here, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Dan does the legwork and I do the speaking. And right. Thank you for inviting us. We represent Wauwatosa Special Olympics. How many of you know about Special Olympics? How many of you see our athletes in the parade every 4th of July? <laughs> you ever see them more exuberant bunch? <laughs> and it's interesting to listen to you talk because it's deja vu. We have been there. We have done what you have gone through. And uh, at this point in our lives, Dan and I are co-managers for Wauwatosa Special Olympics. We've been doing it for nine years, and we started after we retired mm -hmm. and found out it's taking up a good share of our life. <laughs> but it's for a wonderful reason. Um, there are eight individuals that are on the agency management team. We have secretary, treasurer, um, transportation person, social events, family liaison, all of that. So uh, it's quite an organization. Now, what Special Olympics is designed, and it's structured design for individuals from age eight on up. So now I'm listening to you talk, and I hear you saying four years old, whatever. It's a little bit young, but start thinking in terms down the road. <laughs> um, and we can even have some athletes that are going into their 60s. So. They're allowed to, con to remain in Special Olympics as long as they're willing and able to do it. So our story begins with our daughter, Amy. And Amy is Down syndrome. You said you have a Down syndrome child. Uh, I have to brag because our oldest daughter did a dis dissertation on her when she was at Marquette and entitled it Once in Love with Amy. And the story is hard to tell because I think back to that time when she was four or five and she was playing out in the front yard and there was a knock on the door and it was a neighbor a neighbor i didn't know lived down the corner and around the block and the first thing out of her mouth was is your daughter dangerous and you can imagine even telling the story this day how that felt and we're a faith-filled family i'm not going to deny that and it was like god said hey my way is not your way don't slam the door in her face and so what I did is I invited her in, and we sat down and talked. And we told her what it was like to have a special needs child, what our dreams were, what our hopes were, the unknown future. And so the story began. And she left. I don't know what happened to her. They moved from the neighborhood shortly after that. I would like to hope that she's out there advocating for people with special needs, but I have no way of knowing that. Let's hope at least she's being accepting 
of individuals with special needs because we're all different. We all have something in us that's different. You're not going to be a cookie cutter world. And so these children are so very, very valuable. So that began our journey. And just like you and listening to you talk, we wanted the best for her. We wanted the best education. We wanted the best rec department. We wanted the best of everything. And so we had to fight the battles. I can remember going in with IEPs and Dan and I taking a tape recorder even one time so that we could really advocate for this little girl that we love so much. Well, now Amy is 40, and so the years do fly by, and we did find that Special Olympics was an answer. And the history of Special Olympics is such, I don't know if you know this, but Eunice Kennedy Schreiber is the individual that started Special Olympics. <coughs> and she saw that there was a need out there, that there wasn't very much being offered to individuals with special needs in the late 50s and early 60s. So she started Camp Schreiber, Schreiber and uh, from there it blossomed. And in 1968, Edward Kennedy announced the, the formation of Special Olympics Incorporated. And from there it blossomed. It was, when you hear of the Olympics, they gave permission to Special Olympics to also carry that name in conjunction with the Olympics. So now Special Olympics is also at an international level along with the Paralympics. <clears throat> the tiers of Special Olympics are international, national, state, regional, and our agencies. And that's what we are, Wauwatosa Special Olympics. Wauwatosa is approximately 37 years old. We've been around that long. We have a, a roster right now of about 101 athletes, and that fluctuates. Some athletes, you know, they get older and they end up leaving, and perhaps they're getting too old to compete. Perhaps they take on jobs. They're not able to do it anymore. Uh, they move from the area. But for the most part, those that come into it really do love it. And uh, it is very, very valuable to them. We have athletes that come in from other agencies into our agency to, to get the benefits of the sports that we offer. Because we do offer, uh, let's see, we offer bowling, basketball, swim, soccer, track and field, golf, bocce, and bocce. And the athletes compete in no more than two sports a season. So this is seasonal. There's a beginning, there's a bit end. And I wanna say that the season is usually, mm, what about, eight weeks long? At the eight most, to 12. yeah, eight to twelve. <coughs> we have <coughs> in Wauwatosa uh, Special Olympics, we have no paid positions. All the donations, all the fun, the fundraising that we do goes to the athletes and the programming. If you go to the state level or the national level, of course, those are paid positions. Even the regional level, the regional offices, which are in Port Washington, though, that, those are paid positions. But these little small agencies are all don't and that's because we have wonderful, wonderful volunteers. At this point in our history, we have 32 certified coaches. They also have assistant coaches, and we have 106 registered aid volunteers. Now that's a little deceiving because some of these are parents that simply drive athletes, or they're up there in age and they really know not that much involved anymore, but it's a, it's a pretty solid agency. And we work in conjunction with other agencies. Now right now we're working with Mike Wick uh, to get a soccer field for our soccer that's going to be beginning very, very shortly. They start indoors, and when the weather gets nice, then they move outdoors. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, we operate under the rules of the international organization. And that's where we're gonna differ differ from the rec department as I listen to you talk. You cannot just bring an uh, athlete in to just have fun. It's actually geared for them to learn and grow in the sport that they're doing. And they can start out, and I have seen eight-year-olds that the only thing they could do was the dog paddle. But then by the end of two seasons, you should see them go. And you should see their parents, and the, the athletes themselves, how very, very proud they are of themselves. 
The rules are very sport specific. We can't fudge them. We can't say we're going to put up bumper bowling to give the athlete an advantage. It all has to fall under the rules and guidance of Special Olympics. And it's amazing. You think, oh my gosh, my, my child just can't do that. Well, all of a sudden, they get one spare. And they start listening to what the coach is saying. And all of a sudden, they get another one. And pretty soon, they're going along and they're achieving. And it's, it's just amazing. The athletes can advance to regional and state competitions. Uh, they can even be selected to go to national and international competitions. And we have a picture there of our latest international athlete. You may have seen him in his, the community. His name is Tim Maloney. He works at a McDonald's in, um, you know which uh, one it is? 124th Street somewhere. 124th. He went to Beijing. Mm -hmm. And we were so proud to be able to send him to that. And um, he did us proud. He came home with, I believe it was a gold and a silver. And so that was the selection process. And then they determined who they're able to send. Come July, we're sending two Wauwatosa athletes to the national competition. And now those will be in New Jersey. Dan and I have to do a little back padding. We sent our daughter Amy to nationals in 2006. And we have her history book there with her medals. And she took two golds and a silver. And it was amazing. A wonderful, wonderful time for our family. So, um, am I forgetting anything? The athlete motto for the Special Olympics, and you may have heard this, is let us win, but if we cannot win, let us be brave in the attempt. And those athletes personify that motto. If they can't win, they're rooting for their friends or the other athletes that are crossing the line and just wishing them the very best. And your heart just swells. So it is an option for all cognitively challenged individuals. Um, I think that's about it. Do you have anything, honey? Any questions for me? What was the lower level, lower age limit? You had age eight. Age eight, okay. Right. How, how did, you know, how did Tim end up going to China? Like, how do you get he selected get or the he, people that went to New Jersey? What they basically do is take any athlete that has competed and made it to the state level. Every athlete has an option, uh, has an opportunity to make it to state. And they usually take first, second, and all first, second, and third places according to quota because there's funding issues. And once they make it to state, then every two years, the national competition will say, this year we're looking for people in track, this, pe this year we're looking pe for people in volleyball, etc., etc. And so you know of that as a parent, you can talk to the coach and say, do you think you could recommend and have my athlete go, would you write a recommendation, or us as agency managers, even yourself, you would send in the paperwork. And then they would go to a camp and they would determine whether they were, would qualify for nationals. Once they usually accomplished a national status, then for international, they will do that same kind of selection. It will have to be somebody that has gone to the nationals that they know can handle that kind of pressure because they go as a delegation. They're not with their parents. Parents can go and watch, even at nationals. Parents can go and watch, but the delegation goes together as Team Wisconsin. So it's, they love it. And once they get a taste of going to state where they're up there, and they're with a group of kids, and they're with their coaches and with the A volunteers, without mom and dad, they absolutely, boy, turn me loose, let me do this. And so the big hope is, oh, maybe this year I'll go to state. And then the parents, too. They go up, they stay at a hotel, they watch them compete, and it is a really, really exciting time. Are you able to read off the sports a little slower? Sure, sure. That you offer in Wauwatosa? Okay, Wauwatosa offers bowling, basketball, and that's team basketball and skills basketball, where they start out learning to dribble and so forth, put the basket into the hoop and so forth. And you correct me if I get these wrong. Swim. <laughs> swim starts out, they usually at least to have, have to have some swimming skills. You know, they can't be going in there not, not knowing how mm -hmm. to do 
at least the do dog paddle. I think of one of our athletes, so that's all he could do in the beginning was a dog paddle. And he, within a matter of three years, he worked himself up to taking gold in, in the various different strokes and so forth. So he did extremely well. Uh, let's see, soccer, track and field. And track and field is both walking and running. We have power walking and running. Golf, and that's usually unified partners. So if you have a wonderful mom or dad that's a great golfer, wants to do a sport with their athlete, they're, they can be unified partners. What does that mean? It's what an alternate mean? shot. It's an alternate words. shot. So in other words, if the, the athlete, athlete teed up on the first tee, then the, the gentleman or mother would hit the second ball. So it just keeps all day to hit the ball in, in the hole. So oh, okay. that's unified partners. Okay. Uh, and let's see. Doesn't help my kid. <laughs> bocce. Bocce and bocce. Yeah. So are good. there other sports that Wauwatosa doesn't offer but other people <coughs> offer? Yes, and okay. that would be taking the athlete from Wauwatosa and crossing them over to another agency for that oh. specific sport. And then they come back to us for the others. Um, the ones that we cross over for are baseball, t-ball, volleyball, flag football, which is very new, gymnastics, and snowshoeing. And we just don't offer those because of the fact uh, it might not be an interest with enough athletes or a coach. Mm -hmm. All of these that we do offer, we have coaches that are dedicated and, and mm -hmm. want to do it, you know, so uh, that's why we offer these sports that we have here. We're always in need of coaches. We're always in need of volunteers. Right now, our swim coaches have served us for seven years. Their son is getting into his early 20s and is going in, is working, going into other things. So they're going to be dropping as swim coaches. So we're going to be looking very seriously for some new swim coaches. So it's a it's a constant changeover. Right. You know, I had a question because. Um, I was looking for a basketball program mm -hmm. for my daughter, um, and tell me if this is right or not, but um, when I checked in or spoke with some other folks about Special Olympics, because it's a team sport, um, apparently you, you like get matched with similar, like you could be like similar skills, but you might be eight or nine years old with 40 year olds on yes, your team. That is, is that true? true? It's, it's designed okay. more towards ability than right. age. Okay, so what is like the median age of the, the 101 athletes or so in that you said? There isn't a some? median age, unfortunately. Okay. It's all over the board and there's different skill sets. Right. And so consequently they'll be divisioned differently. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you may get a team from Team Milwaukee that you look at those athletes and you wonder why they're in Special Olympics <laughs> because they are so very good. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get another team that is, is just you know doing the basic skills of getting it down the court and into the basket and know, know the game. But they try to division it accordingly so that that athlete achieves in their own division and then they would go to state in their own division. They would not end up playing the team from Team Milwaukee that looks like they're the Bucks. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how it's, and that's the same in any of the sports. Mm -hmm. They're divisioned and for instance, when Amy does her power walking, they'll st when she does the 3,000 meter, which is over 45 minutes of walking, you see these athletes go out and go, oh my God, she's laugh. But she's divisioned according to her ability. So there may be a group of five or six or seven in her division and she ends up taking first. Mm -hmm. So if you had an elementary age child, mm -hmm. it sounds like it might be, and if you were a parent kind of concerned about your child being with, you know, adults, older, right. bigger, taller people, <coughs> it sounds like you, it would that be best to it. sign up for like track, right? Or no, 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 I wouldn't say that at all because you will find that when you put a younger with an older, the older ones will mentor mm -hmm. the younger ones, and you find that camaraderie develop, and they become a cohesive unit, mm -hmm. and so that no longer becomes an issue. And it's amazing, because 
you know, as they get older, 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 you're not going to see them as much. But and you will see a group that is in that maybe that age group that is more together. But um, it's amazing how it blends. So are the majority of the 101 athletes are they below 20 or are they? Is it no, I I would say the majority of our athletes are over the age of 20. Okay. Yeah. But we do have a lot of. But we do have a lot of young ones, yeah. So. And they usually start out in in uh, bowling. That's something they can come to after school and start out. And then basketball skills is a popular one. And soccer. We have a wonderful, wonderful soccer coach. And we have several soccer coach assistants that, you know, he just really works. And he's always encouraging them. A great guy, Jim Haas, he's from the community. And uh, so that's a program that really attracts the younger kids. So, so how does that work in that... Um your practices, you have weekly practices? It's or? weekly practices for the season. Right now we're just wrapping up basketball. Our competitions uh, for the region have just occurred and now we have, we're sending one team to sectionals and that team will have an opportunity to compete and hopefully go to state. So then when that is done, then the swim has already started. Swim practice has already been in since January. Uh, track and field is going to be starting very soon. They'll start inside at the Pettit Center, and as soon as the weather gets nice, then they move outside to Hart Park. And uh, that's on Monday nights. Swim is on Wednesday Swim nights? Swim on Wednesday nights. It's usually just once a week, you know, mm -hmm. our, our sports. Uh, Soccer practice. will be starting soon. They're starting uh, in with, at Whitman, mm -hmm. and they will be practicing inside and then moving outside. Now that said, any child that, or any um, individual that becomes an athlete, they need to have a physical. And we cannot allow any athletes in without having a physical. And it's on a special Olympic form. So if you're interested, you gotta get a hold of us so we can get that form to you. And uh, then that form is sent to the state along with, uh, it's a release form that you have to sign and other information that comes to us. And then your athlete is okay okay to participate, and that's good for three years, and then you have to renew it. So, and that's part of my job, is calling the parents and reminding them that their athletes need to renew their physicals. Now, there is a, a real, it's called a young athlete program. They start off two and a half years old to seven. So if, uh, And it's not with Wauwatosa, it's, no. yeah. I'm actually offering it. For yeah. <laughs> oh, you are, okay. And I think I said that for that one. <laughs> And that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good way to step in to moving up yep. Yep. into it. So, what is your? It says Deanna here. I'm sorry. What Mary was Ellen. Mary Ellen. And we have some brochures oh, there okay. that have both Perfect. of our names. Right. And um, and you had a question? I I do. Um, what what is the requirement? Like, what disability do you? They need to be cognitively challenged. So when they have a physical, the doctor will identify what that disability is. They can also have physical challenges, but they must have a cognitive disability. It cannot just simply be physical. Is there like a certain IQ cutoff? I don't think they use IQ at all. I, you know, they'll take a look at what the disability is, what the doctor writes down, and then we go accordingly. Okay. Yeah, we have a range of some are not verbal, you know, and some are very verbal, and, and some you would look at them and say, well, like I say, it's, it's, so it's a wide it's range. It's really broad. Uh, yeah. So you're saying a physician is making that determination. Right. Yes, we, we always question that ourselves, you know, because somebody would call up and say we'd like a medical form, so we give them the whole brochure and everything, you know, and, and then they fill it out, send it back to us, and we send it up to the state, and that's in Madison, and they control pretty much everything up there. And I asked the state one time, I said, well, who decides, you know, is it really the physician that decides if this person is cognitively disabled? Well, but they put on their, you know, that's what we go by, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of leeway there, you know, and that's what Mary Ellen was referring to, some of the other teams that we see, you know, that might be, you know, you wonder what their disability is, you know. But Our coaches are, are, our certified coaches are required to do certification every three years, so that is very, very essential that they're up on their sport. They also are required, along with every single volunteer, to uh, do a um, behavioral, protective behavioral test. And that is 
to refresh them in working ethically and correctly with athletes. Every volunteer go undergoes a background check by the state. So they are very, very careful to try not to let anybody in to the organization that would be working with the athletes that would take advantage of them. Any other questions? Well, just cheer our athletes on. You see them in the parade. Oh, They're just does. a great <laughs> bunch of people. And there are, like I say, a little brochure, and then we have one of our cards here, too, with our name, email address, and everything. So if you wanted it, uh, you can always email us or call us or whatever. Any information we can give you, uh, we'd be glad to do that. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Very important. Now you know why I didn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it going. Okay. James, uh, do you um, want to show the video first? Yeah, I'll uh, sure we have the I have a short video um, that might demonstrate our program in action better than I can in words. Um, but I'm James, and I represent the YMCA, but more importantly, um, the Miracle of Milwaukee, which partnered with the YMCA. Um, so it's a baseball program for kids with disabilities, ages 4 to 19. Um, our game, we take games over the summer, we play two innings. Um, Everybody runs the bases, everybody hits, everybody plays the field. Um, so I'll stop talking, I'll let the video play, and I'll talk more. It's the miracle of for every child, every child has a team, volunteers, we do volunteer orientation, 
orientations twice before the season starts. Um, so we play a video for them, we prepare them for the season, how to handle the different disabilities and things like that. Um, we do the same thing for players. Uh, we do the volunteer or player orientation, so they'll come in. We'll take them on the field. Um, we'll get them accustomed to things very slowly. Um, so prior to each game, we do a practice, about a 15-minute practice. Instead of just showing up to play, we try to get them, you know, really in the baseball mode. So one week it might be a 15-minute practice on simply swinging and putting the bat down and not throwing it. That might be one practice. Next will be, you know, <laughs> throwing it to first base. Simple things like that. So, um, gosh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some things on it. But any questions directly with your food? Um, maybe it said it down there, but where is the field located? Great question. Um, so we are on Brown Deer and 91st. It's Swan. Um, it's the John C. Credit Hay YMCA. It's not like your typical YMCA. It's a program center, so we don't have um, the pool, the indoor pool or workout facility. Um, so we strictly do programs out of that building. It's kind of isolated off in the woods. It's a very unique um, building. So we have the Miracle League field there. We also have a a brand new playground that's the rubber surface, very soft, wheelchairs, everybody can go on it. Um, and there's also a zero depth pool, which they do do swim lessons over the summer. Um, so we have wheelchairs and everything can go in the water also. Um, so on the flyers, you'll see um, there's the Miracle League brochure, which can provide tons of information as far as the buddy system, the field, the founding of the organization. Um, the Miracle League is a national program. There's five or six locations in Wisconsin alone that also host the program. Uh, again, our field is very unique. It's one of the only ones in the area that's rubberized for wheelchairs and walkers. Um, second flyer, we do a spring training at Miller Park. Um, that is May 17th. Um, so again, volunteers, players get to go down to the bullpen and do a, throw, a short throwing um, and catching tutorial. And then they'll go to go back up into the Sky Lounge for, for food and entertainment. Um, the racing sausages come. Uh, we'll be doing a 50-50 raffle and silent auction, and all those proceeds go back to re directly back towards the league. Um, then you'll see our Miracle League flyer. So we, the spring training, May 17th, we do an opening ceremony where the players will meet their volunteer for the season. They'll get handed their jerseys um, and their schedules. First game starts June 17th, that will be a Tuesday. So again, we play Tuesdays and Thursdays, one game a week. Um, and again, the games last about an hour, hour and a half. And then another thing we do more towards September is an all-star game, which we invite all the Miracles from the state to come down. We do a tailgate, they get to go to the Brewers game. Um, so lots of fun events, um, not only the league, but we do a lot of things to keep the families together, the volunteers together. Um, and really build a community that way. Um, lastly, the flyer in there, um, we're a growing program. The Miracle League is entering its fourth year. Um, I'm relatively new. I'm the inclusive recreation manager for the YMCA of Milwaukee. Um, I started in December. But through the through Miracle League, we've offered programs in the off season to keep our families involved. They really found it comforting to stay connected with each other. Um, and the kids love it also. So. Um, we started a basketball program, um, not competitive as your Special Olympics, but we do skills and drills. We incorporate a scrimmage at the end so they can get the transition offense and defense. Um, we had about 18, 20 kids, again, volunteers for everybody. Um, we get a lot of youth basketball teams, high school basketball teams come out and volunteer with the program. So um, we apply real skill there. Um, and then we started a bowling program, which we're doing now. There's 30 plus kids in that. Um, and again, we have volunteers on each lane that will help out in any way, grabbing balls. We have ramps. We have it all. Um, Cardinal Stretch University bowling team comes out and helps with that. They do a little demonstration in the beginning of practice or the event. Um, so last week they did the proper approach. So they showed them the lines, the proper approach. Um, <laughs> The place was dead silent. I, <laughs> they listened to a T on everything they said. Um, and then lastly, we're doing art at the John C. Cudahy Center. There's 13 kids signed up for that. The room gets kind of crowded. Um, 
but the first week they did a painting of live flower base in front of them. Um, last week they put together uh, jellyfish with different materials, papers, strings, things like that. So again, volunteers for everybody in that program also. Um, yeah, I guess that's my my spiel on the programs that were offered. Participate last summer. We had eight teams. Um, we also do a fall season, which starts in early September. Um, and with that, we do a Tuesday practice. Last year, we had UW Milwaukee baseball team come out. Um, they would do a practice on Tuesday nights, and then games would be on Saturday. Um, I'm also a UW Milwaukee alum. I played baseball, so I have a good background in baseball. Not that <laughs> particularly matters. Um, but yes, those are our programs. Uh, yeah. What's the cost of the Miracle League? So the Miracle League, it's twenty-five dollars for entire summer season. Um, it includes jersey, and we provide all the bats, baseballs, helmets, everything. So we really just need you guys to show up in gym shoes and your jersey, and we're we're good to go. Um, the Miracle League was all for and by donations and fundraising. Um, so Teddy Warner, who's on the video, he's a uh, chief of something with the Brewers, um, so very high up, he did tons of fundraising, um, and there's other admirals that are involved and different organizations like that, so um, we have $25 for the summer season, and then you'll see spring training, it's $10 for the players and um, 20 for adults, um, really we just cover the costs with, with, what, we, with what we charge, so. Any other I learned about the Miracle League from another Tosa family, and we, we joined um, last summer and played, and all my daughter wanted, because her brother played a lot of baseball, and all she wanted was a shirt with a number on the back. Like, that's it. Aww. They have shirts with numbers <laughs> on the back. They have to get a hat, too. Yes, um, and it truly has been a great experience because there are other kids, you know, her age to be playing with, and we've made friends with other kids. And people come, I mean, it's crazy where some people are coming, driving down, yeah. just for the opportunity to do these sort of things. And um, this year, I think it was the first day of school, but you had an event at the field. And Jonathan Lucroy, from yeah. the Brewers came, along with Marco Estrada, one of the pitchers. And you know, now, I know there were some Tosa students that skipped school that day. Because <laughs> <laughs> what are your oh, no. chances of being able to have Jonathan Lucroy catch for you? You know, and Marco Estrada pitch to you. We didn't skip school. We didn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're not going to report to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know anything about that. But no, I mean, and I think James does, you know, his parents were always like, don't burn him out. I mean, the, the man, like, does crazy amounts of stuff. <laughs> And it's great to see the high schoolers without disabilities being paired. I just think it teaches them yeah. something too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good to see them being paired with the kids so, coming for the I mean, sports. One of our main goals is parents aside, they get to sit and watch for an hour, hour and a half of their, their day or week and we take full responsibility for the kids on the field. So, we have a lot of high school kids looking for, for volunteer hours. We get a lot of college students from the summer that are looking for the same thing. Um, young professional groups and Cardinal Strip softball teams, we get a lot of teams that use it as team building experiences and things like that. So um, it's a good experience for everybody, volunteers, families, participants, so, and myself. <laughs> For both the Miracle League and for Special Olympics, you ever tap into the high school? They have yes. the Best Buddies program. Mm -hmm. My daughter oh, yeah. actually did Special Olympics yeah. stuff through Best Buddies. Yep. They really loved it. They're a great partner with our collaboration. Um, I volunteer with a number of their events. I'll be at their walks and different things like that, too. So, And they send out volunteers, whether it's high school homerooms or um, things like that. So, yep. All right, well, you guys have my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to call or email me anytime. Um, in our website, all these videos and um, registrations, everything's on there also. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, and I think one thing you should, I'm sorry, but one, one <laughs> thing too that some parents had told me is that with 
with the Miracle League or the sports that you operate, you can have any kind of disability. So right. you don't have to just have a cognitive disability. And I know for some parents that we've met who have kids with physical disabilities, I mean, some pretty significant physical yeah. disabilities, but don't have any cognitive impairment, it's a really good recreational outlet for them. Like I said, yeah, we, we have not known anybody. Um, four to 19, it's a pretty broad range. Um, I mean, we, last year we had one standout who could hit a home run and You're I mean, all afraid of him. Yeah, we, <laughs> volunteers stepped in front for that when he batted. Um, but I mean, so the, continuing on, um, we do have the tease for everybody. Some players grow into being able to hit a soft toss pitch. So we're fully adaptive. Um, and with the one-on-one -on -one volunteers, we're able to keep everybody engaged, whether they're in the outfield or on the pitcher's mound. So um, that's another unique thing that we do. And so do you have multiple teams then? Do the eight we have eight teams, so okay. I think they maybe played the same team once throughout the entire season. So it was always new families um, each week, new uh, players and things like that too. So. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I want to thank our guests for coming in. Uh, understandable, James, uh, Mary Ellen, Dan, if you guys need to take off. I unfortunately do. <laughs> no, I'm much busy and I know that these, uh, these activities stretch your time. Get an email from our, our region. Yeah, I talked to her. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Look forward to it. Thank you. Summer school program, okay. you know. <laughs> All right. Summer school. So a few years ago, I started uh, summer school as a special ed teacher. Um, and since then, the summer school program has doubled and quadrupled and grown exponentially. I mean, right now we have over 3,000 general students enrolled each summer and, and over 200 special ed students enrolled in summer school. Um, and we have special, back when I, when I started a few years ago, there really wasn't a whole lot of special ed student options. We had self-contained classes and then we just had just general summer school classes that the students could enroll in. And you're talking summer school, not extended school year. Well, correct, right. No, I'm, that's kind of all part of the same thing. Extended school year is what I might call our self-contained classes. All right. So of the 200 kids with special needs, how many are in extended school year? About, about 30. About 30. So. In one classroom? No. No. <laughs> no. No, maybe total. Why not? Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have uh, classes going on at East, West, Eisenhower, Lincoln, and both the middle schools now. Um, and we offer, now, we offer not only the ESY classes, but we have special skills class, we have special intervention classes, um, we have general classes that students enroll in with some support if needed. Uh, we have special kinds of kindergarten arrangements. Um, and we have support for high school students who are enrolling for a credit recovery or to try to work ahead to, to earn some high school credits. Okay, so pretty much we serve kids from three years old all the way through high school now. Um, the way that we've kind of tried to run things is that we, well, it's pretty much me <laughs> who tries to disseminate all the different kinds of IEP information that parents want teachers to have. Uh, like you said, you want your teachers to know about your child, and we get that. So we try to do a system where it's run through your special ed teacher. So at your school, the special ed teacher should help you with enrolling your child in summer classes if you're interested. Um, and that involves maybe signing a permission form mm -hmm. for IP information. Um, but then that all comes to me. 
And so you can think about it, 200 special ed applications that I have. Um, I personally run off IEP information for those 200 students because of confidentiality. And it's nothing complete IEP, it's just a little, a mini. Uh, mostly contact information, goals, present level, you know, like an IEP snapshot if you're familiar with that. What, uh, with that. Um, I then and think about this too, many of our 200 special ed students are enrolled in three classes because there's an 8.30, 9.30, 10 30 class. So if you multiply that 200 by three classes, that's like 600 IEPs that I personally run off. And then we try to, we have to run off everybody's schedule. So we met, can you imagine that? 200 schedules. Um, and then I have help. Then I have a teacher on the east side and a teacher on the west side who helps get all of that out to all the different classrooms, teachers, whoever needs that information. We typically don't do rec department. You know, like mm -hmm. the swimming class, we don't really do the rec department. This is strictly for things listed as summer school. Um, so that's kind of the system right now. So I can understand that maybe something, somebody fell through the cracks and didn't make it, and I apologize. I know we're not perfect, we do our best to try to get that out there. Um, oftentimes, too, students sign up for a three-week class and then they're in different three-week classes, the second session. So then we do the whole process over again. Um, so there's a lot of you know, paperwork and people trying to get information to teachers. We ask teachers to you know, let us know if something, if, a ch if they think that maybe a child might be somebody with, a, with an IEP. Um, we ask parents to really stay on top of it. If something doesn't seem right, please speak up. The other thing you can do if you're worried about your child making sure the summer staff knows about your child is really talk to your special ed teacher. Um, because special ed teachers will flag kids for me and say, you know, this person, this parent is really worried about their student maybe transitioning between classes because they go from an 8.30 class, a 9.30 class, a 10.30 class. Mm -hmm. And these are first and second graders and third graders, you know, little guys. Um, so, that special ed teacher will communicate to me then if there's some special concerns there. Also, another thing to do too is when you actually sign up through the rec department, there's a way to indicate that your child has an IEP. There, uh, I believe the statement has, does your child have any special concerns or considerations, correct? Right. So if you ding that and you can, there's a place for you to write, my child has an IEP, that's another way. Because that actually shows up on that teacher's roster then. It's okay. actually, it actually shows up. So if it's there and she doesn't have the paperwork, then she could she tries to contact me and follows up. That what way. should you write in the box? Like what what are, what are the things you should suggest? Uh, just write? my child has an IEP. I okay. usually write um, hearing impaired. Please see I. Okay. All right. That would work too. That should. Work. I, I, I yeah. The, that should work. I really want them <laughs> to just look for the hearing aid, so that's why she's not listening. And then IEP. Sure. Um, so anyway. That's kind of what we try, I mean, we do our best. Mm -hmm. We do our best. It's not a perfect system, um, but that's, those are my suggestions to you. So, for making sure that your, your summer staff knows about your child. Do they have the IEPs like day one? If, if your child is doing a six week class, would the teacher have the IEP? That's our goal. But you know, oh, before day one so they can look at it? That's our goal is before, we usually have one training day like the day before summer school starts when all 300 teachers and staff members show up. Okay. So, and that's when we're frantically trying to, to get information out. To and some of them are, I mean, obviously not everybody's a district employee either, Correct. so. So we're, okay. we're, we're careful about that. Yeah. It's all, you know, everything is written, you know, in a confidential way, there's confidential yeah. written on it. It's in a folder, it's treat, you know, we emphasize that this is confidential information, treat it that way. We collect them all at the end of the session, first session, and then redistribute them all for session two if you're in a three-week class. Yeah, I guess what I was getting at is that if you don't have, it sounds like most people may not be district employees, so they're only here the day before right. summer school starts, Right. and they're gonna get the IEP. Even the district employees, there's usually just one work day okay. before summer school starts. All right. So. You know, and that's the day they have to learn, you know, how to access the summer school systems. Mm -hmm. We also provide, and we provide all medical services, but health plans or something else that I distribute. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned behavior plan, behavior plans. The principals of each site has 
um, a listing of students who have health plans and behavior plans. Um, our district nurse comes to that training day and trains everybody in seizure procedures, EpiPens, and all those different things our, our students have. Yeah, it's a lot we have it, it is. It's, a, it's like starting, you know, a big, I mean, you can imagine, 200 special ed kids, yeah. you know, school on, in one day's time. Um, when, that you have staff, mm -hmm. when, when you have all your staff. So mm -hmm. it's a big undertaking, but, and we do our best, but, you know, we really ask parents to, you know, please understand and please, please speak up if something isn't right or, you know, if you feel like your child's teacher didn't get the information they needed. Mm -hmm. Because it's not perfect, mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, we're not taping anymore, are we? That might be a good thing. Like if, if, if that's the end of the, you know, oh. of the official, uh, <laughs> that's pretty what much you want to share. Um, you know, the goal of summer school is really to try oh. to maintain some skills. For kindergartners, it's, it's socialization. It's to provide some structure for some students, you know, that, that structured, a little bit of structure in their day. It's a half a day. It's not as intense as regular school is. It's not so, you know, you're not focused on testing and, you know, report cards and, and projects and homework and mm -hmm. it's more for just skill maintenance and just gives the kids an opportunity to practice their skills over the summer. Mm 